with our first speaker. Her name is Mrs. Ungozi Achonwa. Um, Ungozi is a woman of faith and passionate about children. Although she studied zoology for her first degree, her passion for children led her to pursue a master's degree in education administration from the University of Lagos in Nigeria. She's a proprietress of Ziggy Wisdom Schools. She's a health and wellness coach, an organic and alternative nutritionist, and a network marketing professional. Um, she teaches, sorry, let me flip this up. She teaches um, people to eat their way to rejuvenate and be younger as well. All right, thank you, Miss. Mrs. Akshonwa, thank you for, for accepting the invitation to come and share with us. You are most welcome. I hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Bola. It's a privilege um, to be on this platform. I thank you, Monique, for this privilege and also a call to answer for the necessity of this hour. <laughs> because digital education is actually a new reality not just for teachers, but for parents, for the students, pupils also, and even for our nation as at large. It's something that we need to look into. And, you know, as I, I, I talk today, I also like to, you know, share my personal experience as a proprietress, as a mother, because I still have my last two children in Covenant University, and um, concerned parents also, and also a philanthropist in the community around. So first of all, I just want to briefly say what's digital education. Digital education is the innovative use of digital tools and technologies during teaching and learning. And it's often referred to as technology enhanced learning, TEL or e-learning as most people will, you know, know and, and, and say it to be. And it's a term that Actually, especially in the world where we are, in the suburban area, hasn't been mentioned a lot. We are so used to classroom experiences. I can remember when I started my school in 2005, and I, I had to go for some trainings in UK. I had to come back and continue the, the schooling online. I tried to bring in some of my teachers then, and it was like, a lot of work for them, as if it's something they can't really, you know, do. And um, drawing one back and the rest. So it was something like we put out and left and went back to our normal manual classroom experience. And each time I tried to bring in e-learning, it was difficult. But a few teachers that actually caught that went into it. So briefly, if we look at the benefits of digital education, number one, it improves engagement. When technology is integrated into lessons, students are expected to be more interested in the subjects than are studying. Of course, when we introduce like um, um, DVDs and the children learned from the DVDs in schools and they had these uh, small computers, it was really interesting. It also improves, you know, knowledge retention because when people see what they are being taught practically, especially when they use technology to practice, like the computer science and the rest, it's, it's actually easier. It also in, in encourages individual learning. Like when we introduced um, tablets into the school, um, I noticed that a lot of students actually liked the the experience and it made them to learn more. It also is collaboration and students can learn useful life skills through technology also. And even for the teachers, it gives, it gives them flexibility and you know, easy storage of resources that they get. All these are done with technology. Also, it encourages better parent involvement because when parents, you know, when you have all these devices, the children get to share with the parents and they talk about it in, at home when they get home. It also gives students some element of control over time, especially for assignments that are done online and submitted online. It helps the children. And when we talk about, you know, give, having control over time, over place of studies, part of study and pace of studies, especially for schools that have actually integrated the digital education, this helps, you know. So if we, if we also talk about 
after seeing all these benefits. Like for us, the little, for me, what we've done in the school is to bring in step, step by step and little by little. But during this pandemic, we didn't have any choice but to almost go all digital, especially also for, because we in our school, when we heard about the short lockdown, we had to quickly finish our exams. And because we're in the suburban areas, we could do one or two days extra to tidy up, finish up all the scores and you know, send the report sheets to parents through e-technology again, you know? And it wasn't difficult for me as a person because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something I've always looked forward to, something I've always done in bits in the school, like our results actually go through, you know, um, e-learning process. We don't give out um, hard copies. You have to download your results so that parents will be able to have good storage system for their results. So we use like SkyGate and some of these other, you know, companies that, that place. But during this pandemic, it's, it, it's, it, I really say colleagues have shared that they had with the online and digital education has been like, you know, limited feedback. Some of them say they drop in classes for the children and they don't get to know if they actually did it because some wouldn't know how to return the assignments back to them. Also, it also brings social isolation, e-learning, self-motivation, actually, and time management skills. This time management is one of the issues that we also had processes and lack of communication skills by teachers and students. In fact, I had a case that I had to ask a teacher to drop while we were having our lessons for the third time. I had to ask her to you know, stop because many parents were complaining. And even me, I saw that she couldn't actually communicate. All the methods that we were taught wasn't really you know, OK for her. She couldn't even handle an Android phone. We had to start from you know, afresh to teach her what's an Android phone, how to handle an Android phone. And it wasn't even actually lay her off as from the digital education and she had to go into other areas. Then the assessment, cheating during assessment is actually unavoidable during you know, e-learning, generally for most people. But let me even go deep and then look at the suburban areas of Nigeria, like where we are, where I have my school in Ibafo and some other suburban areas. Most people who are in these um, places are people who, because of economical stress, standard of living in the urban areas like Lagos, they have to move over to this place. So the first challenge that we had as a school was the change factor. The change factor. First of all, that you know, we are like, eh? Okay. I mean, because you are breaking up. Hello, ma'am. Sorry. We, we, so that was we, first thing to. We seem to be having a little problem with the connection. I think your line is lagging a bit. Can you hear us? Hello, ma'am. Okay, we seem to have lost her completely now. Am I still with you? Okay, yes, you're back now. Am I still with you? Yes. Okay, sorry. So I was talking about the change factor. Yeah. And, um, you know, the sudden change, if it was something that was planned and teachers were carried along, trained, and parents, you know, trained, 
and you know it's well done, it would have been easier. Then the second constraint was financial constraint. Parents complain so much about buying data. Teachers also complain so much about buying data that the data the school sent to them wouldn't be enough, you know. And um, like for us, when we started, we decided to go into using WhatsApp and Telegram. Because most parents did not even have an idea of any app. I, I, I allowed my teachers to go through a first two weeks training on the digital education app. I got a company that could help us. We went through and spent all the time and resources to do that without actually thinking about our parents. That was the first issue we had. So by the time we finished all the training and learning and we came to impute the tell parents about it to Mm. Well, sincere apologies for this for oh. the technical Have issues Hello, Ma. Your line is breaking up again. And there seems to be a major lag on the line. Okay, I think maybe what we can do, Mrs. Action, the line is so bad, um, we're not able to continue this um, session. I, I think it would be best to, to probably just move on. If we have time at the end, maybe we'll come back to you again. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Our second speaker, unfortunately, hasn't also been able to log on. She's been having some technical issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Faith. Faith, are you there with us? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll just introduce Faith. And then we'll have a little chat with her and then hopefully come back to, to one of our speakers. So, yeah, sorry, Ma, we're not able to hear you. So we're, we're going to move on now to, to, to Faith. So Faith is a, is a fourth year, uh, is a, she's, she's a 14 year old, 11th grade student at the Ambassador College, Nigeria. She is passionate about her studies and has represented her school in various competitions, such as Child Genius Nigeria, American Mathematics Competition, South African Mathematics Olympiad, Kangaroo Sans Frontiers, amongst others. Wow. She has won the Mathematics Queen of Nigeria Award by the Nigerian Mathematics Center on two consecutive years. And she enjoys, she's going to tell us a little bit about what she enjoys and what she would like to be when she grows up. So Faith, can I, I'll stop sharing, I'll allow, allow you to share your screen, but if you could answer those questions for us to kick, kick you off, that would be great. What do you enjoy doing? Sorry, Mubala. Okay. Hello? I enjoy traveling, reading, and cooking. Okay. Okay. everybody. And what what are you aspiring to be when you when you grow up? I want to be a computer engineer. Wow, well done. All the Thank best you. with that. Okay, so you, I'm inviting you to share your screen. And um, we'll hand over to you now. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Faith Adelity from the Abbasel's Daughter. Good morning, everybody. I'm Faith Adelity from the Abbasel's College Daughter. And today I'll be speaking to you about digital education a new reality for teachers. So, first of all, what I'll be speaking to you about, I'll be speaking to you about, sorry. 
these are my slides, these are what I'm talking to you about, G2 education mainly. So, because of this COVID-19 pandemic, most of us have been forced to go home and to just stay away from others. So, we all know that we can't learn that way by staying away from each other. So, there's no other thing we can do apart from embrace embracing digital learning. There's nothing else you can do. So digital learning is, is replacing traditional learning every day. They're changing rapidly. The way my parents were taught 20 years ago, I mean, now. My parents used to tell me that my parents used to tell me that they used to learn from slates, but we don't even know what a slate is in this generation. So it's not likely that uh, the future generation will be laughing that oh, you used to campaign to, to learn. Will not so, I believe all of you can see my slides. Yeah. Yes, we can. Keep going. Sorry. We're able to see Faith, and would you like to carry on? Okay, so, yes, yes. So what is digital education? Digital education is the use of digital tools and technologies in teaching and learning. Some people call it technology and learning or e-learning. So it can take the form of blended learning or fully online learning. What, what are the advantages of this book, big bugs and Facebook. I don't have a way. I have to carry my phone and my laptop and I'm... the world the wide library is available to me as a student, as a student or to be as a I can just carry my phone around. There's millions of books on the internet. Are you having some trouble with your slides, Faith? Would you like me to share it from my end? Yes. Please bear with us. Thank you. She's very sure. Welcome. Okay, can you see it now? I think you may have made yes. some changes to this after. Yes. But it's okay, just let it just flow with what you already have in mind. Uh, okay. Let's see. Hold on. Slide show. Is this where you want to be, or? Yes, this is where I am. Okay. So please go to the next slide. Okay. For some apps like WhatsApp and Google Classroom, you can you, some you can just learn at any time you want. Like now, if if maybe teacher is already teaching now, but I don't want to I don't want to read now. I'm not in the mood to read to read yet. I can just say, okay, since it's this app, since it's so 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 app, I can access it later. I can say, okay, yes, I can still read this thing later. So I can read at my own time and pace. I'm not slowing down any class. 
Then long distance learning is less of a problem. Like now we have Sarah from the US over here, and we have Esther from Cyprus, and we have so many other people from different countries over here. Then as a student, we can manage our time. We don't have a particular time for a particular subject. We can just decide, okay, this is a, this particular amount of time I want to allocate for this. That is a particular amount of time I want to allocate for that. Here's the next slide. You can give the student and teacher a worldwide exposure. Like you can see, you can say, okay, yes, so this is also a topic. I can decide, okay, I want to ask, I want to see it based on other people from other countries' view. Then it enhances collaboration and communication. Then I feel on the wrong run. It's more affordable to students. It is more affordable. Like it's better for me to buy to be buying data consistently than for me to be buying textbooks, uniform, pay school fees, this and that. So I feel that generally, on the long run, it's still going to be more affordable. You can access this anywhere and anytime. Like you can say that okay, me and my mom we want to go shopping. Me and my mom want to go shopping, and maybe we're caught in traffic or something. I can just decide that okay, I have my phone. Let me try to access the internet and learn. Then you have comprehensive online tutorials because you have many students that complain that oh, that there's not enough time for that they, that they don't understand how to how to work a particular app. There are so many online tutorials on how to, teaching you on how to work them out. It reduces students and educators to educator technology and the gigantic school infrastructure. And its cost the implication is very past. Also, transportation and its cost, the dangers and the time wasting is also by past. Although this is it's not in this slide, but I have to say it. Mm -hmm. Then you are you are you are open to the library and opinion of others, and it's available to everybody, like you can see. But although I think this is repeated. Next slide. Okay. Then some of these are very to me. The teachers, like there's no, most teachers don't have control over the students. I can already say that I'm tired of this class. Let me just put off my video and sleep. And I hope my teachers are not listening to me. <laughs> so <laughs> the virtual classroom requires computers and internet access open to everybody. I'm sure that in the country of Nigeria now, most of us don't have internet access or the computer, maybe they'll say that, okay, the lights, the, um, what's it called? The light is inconsistent, the power supply is inconsistent. And most of the students lack real-time learning experience by online learning. Please, next slide. Then there are more distractions from, from other things and people around. I can just be maybe reading something on WhatsApp, reading a message from my teacher on WhatsApp, and then you chat me up, and from there I, for, I forgot class. So something else that can be a distraction. Then logistic issues such as laptops, smartphones, availability, router, etc. Then for this last point, I miss my friends. Please, next slide. Then at the beginning, like I, when you first start off, you, you guys might say that, okay, I said that it's cheaper. But at the beginning, because of you buying a laptop, buying a router, buying this, buying that, it's, at the beginning, it's going to seem expensive. And most students lack online, online teaching experience because this thing was imposed. It was so sudden, in, especially in a country like Nigeria. We just suddenly moved because of this pandemic. There's lack of, lack of personality modeling. Then there are some things you can't even learn online, like... You can't say, okay, yes, I want to learn sports online. What are you going to do? Stay on your bed or what? And you can't say that there's every, everybody has chemicals for chemistry particular in their houses. How do you learn medicine without patients and hospitals? Next slide, please. Then what obtains in Nigeria today? In Nigeria, we face many other issues like the irregular power supply, the number of families without power to without computers to use, due to the buy, most of them don't even know how to use this app that we're talking about or these things that we're talking about. Because of data itself is another problem that people will complain about. Next slide, please. 
So what are expects going forward? Specifically, I'm talking, I'm referring to those students who, who take the school as their home, who, who, like, who take the colleges as their only place of, the only place of residence and other type of people. In other words, that is actually most students. So how can we, how can you teachers be saying, okay, we, let's ignore those, let's ignore those particular set of people. You just have to try to help. The next slide. Next slide, please. So, oh dear, looks like we've lost faith on the internet. I understand that the weather is really bad over in Nigeria and this is affecting the the connectivity. Let's see if she'll come back in a minute. If not, okay, I have a poll question that I'll just use while we wait for, for Faith to come back. We'll, we'll launch a poll. If you can just give us your insights on this question and if she's not able to come back, then we'll move straight on to Sarah. Okay, so... On your screen now, you have a question. How much do you enjoy online teaching or learning? Rate on a scale of one to four. Thank you. Thank you for those who are already putting their thoughts in. It's interesting. Okay, I'll leave it on for a few more. minutes or a few more seconds rather okay in the meantime if you have any questions contributions thoughts that you want to share with us please put it on the chat we'll read it out and Sarah if you could just prepare to begin your presentation that would be great I'll stop sharing and I'll end the poll so we seem to have a very positive group here um, overall more than 80% say, I absolutely love it. Yay, I'm hanging in there. Just a few people who hate it or who are just getting by. So it's good to know. Okay, please, let's see if we have any questions or comments. Yeah, I can see that they said the weather is bad, it's raining. That must be what is um, contributing to the issues that we're having with the speakers the first two speakers. Um, so our sincere apologies. No one could have planned for, for that. And these are some of the issues that I'm sure you all know that students face in certain countries with digital technology. So this is it. We're seeing it in real life, in action. Okay, so I think I've shared the results. Okay, so Sarah, are you ready? Once Sarah is finished, we'll try and bring back Faith and Mrs. Achumwa, our third, second speaker. She's also having problems connecting. These are issues, uh, but we'll move forward anyway. So Sarah, are you there? Can you hear us? I'm there. Oh, excellent, excellent. So please, over to you. Okay, all right, let me go ahead and share my screen. Before I do that, yeah. all right. Hopefully, you can see everything. All right. Well, I want to just say welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Sarah Wilson. I am a teacher. I've been teaching for five years. Um, I taught two years in the United States and uh, three years out of the country. So I've been teaching recently in the country of Jordan. And um, I actually got stuck in Cyprus with my uh, family, my parents, uh, when I came here for spring break and uh, was not able to return uh, back to Jordan. Well, I've been teaching uh, my second graders from here in Cyprus, uh, so I know all about the difficulties of online education because I teach eight-year-olds. 
and eight-year-olds on Zoom is a very interesting uh, scenario. Um, so let's go ahead and let's get started. I want to show you my objective for today. And my goal for today is to just encourage and to motivate you as teachers, as support staff, as parents, as students, to embrace educational technology um, and to also discover some ways of implementing remote learning practices in a practical manner. Um, we can dream all we want, but unfortunately, sometimes we need to see the more practical side of things. And so I hope that you, when you leave this seminar and this webinar, you will feel inspired, encouraged, and hopefully a bit more at peace at how this remote learning can look for you and your school. These are going to be my points for um, that we're going to look at today. Um, we're going to look at just how it has globally affected everybody um, and how Africa specifically is in a wonderful position to move forward. We're going to look at how remote learning is going to look. It looks different in every classroom and in every household. Um, we're going to look specifically at countries um, where internet and devices are limited and not even existent. Um, and Sec, uh, the la almost the last one, we're going to jump, uh, see why you need to jump at some opportunities because you have a lot of time right now to learn. Hopefully you have some time to learn, um, but why you need to go ahead and jump on those opportunities. And lastly, I'm going to give you some ideas that I've taken from around the world um, on ways that you can hopefully reach your students and or uh, be able to learn. All right, so point number one. Remote learning is a global phenomenon, and Africa is in a wonderful position to get ahead of this new reality. Um, I want to emphasize, as we go into this one, I want to emphasize just how badly this affected, affected the entire world. Um, I have a pretty, I would think I would have a pretty large uh, teaching community network, and a lot of my friends from all corners of the world are just absolutely um, all I can talk about is just how much it has affected them in different ways. Um, and not only just that, um, I mean, you can just see that it's not just an Africa problem and it's not just a poor country problem. It is a global problem. Um, there are just so many stories coming from the U.S., from Europe, from Asia, from South America, from the South uh, East areas, corners of Asia that um, you know, we're all struggling and we're all in this together. Um, but again, it's gonna look different for all of us. Um, and so that's why, as you can see, there are countries that had to just stop learning altogether. And we don't want that to happen. We want to be very creative and we wanna be very intentional with our instruction so that we do not see education stopping uh, again, like it has. <laughs> so. I know we've already touched on some benefits of online education, but if you're a visual person like me, um, I wanted to give you a visual of why online education is a good thing, um, despite some of its flaws as well. Um, it does provide flexibility. It also provides accessibility, global knowledge, student control study time. This is a big one. You wanna teach your students time management, put them on an online class and they will have to learn some time management skills uh, that they might need for when they go off to like university. Um, it's a chance for interaction. They might be able to interact with other students from around the globe and that's pretty cool. Um, cost effective. I would say that this one can be kind of controversial. Um, on one respect is that yes, the startup cost for online education is going to be high. However, there are ways that it can be done uh, specifically for countries like Nigeria or for other African or other poor nations. There are foundations out there. There are um, scholarships available. Um, it does take a little bit of hard work, but once those have been uh, started, you can go ahead and get that technology. Um, but again, it's gonna look different in your school and how it's going to uh, run in the, where you're at. Um, it does provide better opportunities gets kids prepared for when they go off to university or just for life. Um, and most importantly, though, it is student-centered. Uh, education is now moving to a more student-centered 
um, philosophy. And because of that, you're going to see that having uh, online school can be a little bit more one-on-one. Um, and it also creates a more um, environment where students are now taking responsibility for their work. All right, let's move on. I'm going to show you two platforms that I have found from just my experience, my teacher friend's experience, that they absolutely love. These two platforms are used for communication, for finding resources, for getting into uh, the teaching community, um, and to connect with parents. So the first one is Edmodo. I've actually taken this from their website, but it is a service that my school had to use uh, for the older students. Uh, we did not put the younger students on this. Um, I'll explain that a little bit later on. But it's great for your older students um, because they're able to log in and it's very much like a Google Classroom. They're able to log in. They can uh, go ahead and uh, you know, find their assignments, talk to their teacher directly. Um, they're able to do video. Um, they're able to upload their projects. Everything can be on here. And then parents can access it and actually see what their kids are doing. Uh, which is great accountability. The same is with Seesaw. Seesaw is going to be uh, more for your younger students. It's very hands-on. It's also very colorful and provides a lot of content for uh, teachers to choose from. So there's already lessons available. You just click on the lesson and it sends it to your students. Um, and it's great that they are able to uh, play little videos, and um, what's really cool about Seesaw is that a student can finish an assignment, send it to the teacher, and then the teacher can immediately give feedback on it and then send it back to the student and the parent gets notified on their own phone or their own device. So they're able to immediately see the feedback from uh, their teacher. Now, both of these platforms are free to use as an individual teacher. So I could sign up today for free. But as a school, a school can actually use this as a school-wide platform. So this could be your online school platform. Um, and they do work uh, with the school on a cost um, in order to uh, do this. But both are well-funded and have given scholarships before. So it'd be a great opportunity to look at uh, in the future. But it's something that you might hear me say a little bit more often, uh, especially these two. Uh, one, they're familiar, but also they are uh, really highly recommended amongst uh, schools and just other online associated places. Um, so we're going to go on to our next slide, which is remote learning is going to look different, and that is okay. Um, as a teacher, it, I've taught in many different schools, and every school is just different. Your classroom is different. Your environment's different. Um, and so as you know your students, you know how you're going to be able to reach them. So as your teacher, I'm talking to teachers right now. Teachers, you know how to reach your students. You know your demographics. Um, and you also just know what they can and cannot do. Um, and so, like I said, I taught students who were around eight years old. Um, that's in the U.S., that's second grade two. And I have a lot of students that couldn't speak English. Um, they're Korean and they're actually uh, in a English speaking program, but that stopped when we all went online. And so I had to get pretty creative. It wasn't just me sending them assignments and saying, good luck. You know, had a lot of communication with my parents, but that might look different for you. And that's going to be okay because we cannot assume that one is one thing to fit everybody. Um, so I highly encourage you to uh, do a little bit of research in your time, uh, in the time that you can, to really see what would fit you best. Is it just using WhatsApp? Is it using an app like Seesaw? Is it using Zoom? Um, I use Zoom with my students. Now, I did not teach lessons on Zoom because that is just absolutely chaotic. But we had weekly check-ins. So I would check on them, their emotional being, their health, um, what they've been doing. Um, so 
there's a lot of things out there and it's going to look different for you uh, than it did for me, but that's okay. And uh, we want to embrace that. So I'm actually going to give you some testimonials from some teachers, some of my teachers that I know um, from around the globe on how it looked for them. And then we're going to look at some articles on some more extreme side of what education looked like for places that really had it pretty rough this year. Um, so the first one is my dear friend, Shauna. She actually works at an international school in Vienna. She's at a Christian school. She's their special needs instructor. And she works with younger students. And she was given two days uh, notice before uh, Vienna shut down, Austria shut down all their schools. And they are a smart school. And so for them, kind of like a goal for all of us, uh, for them, they just had all the kids come into class like normal. And they reviewed how you log into Seesaw and how you log into Google Classroom. And then they sent them home and the next day they were online. And um, nothing was, they didn't have any paper. They didn't have to send anything home with students. Um, they sent home some books, but most of it was simply just, we're going online tomorrow. Um, you know, we'll see you on the video and have a great afternoon. So I think for this one, it's more of like, this is the ideal. We all would like to be there. Um, but it is something that happened. And this is kind of like your awesome scenario. Um, and then this teacher, his name's Carl. I don't actually personally know Carl, but I have a friend who works at the school um, that he works at. And she uh, is a very experienced teacher, but she was very traumatized by this whole thing. And so she had asked another teacher to speak uh, on behalf of her school. This is a school in Indonesia. They are in a pretty low uh, income community uh, with a lot of difficulties, internet, all that. And um, I really enjoyed what he had to say about how, you know, this gave him opportunity to do more project, uh, product oriented planning, project based learning, um, and just that one on one communication, which is really cool to see. Um, and something you don't always get in the classroom. Um, I've given my testimony um, because I did come from uh, Jordan, which is a very similar country to a lot of. African countries and just the needs uh, of the people. And uh, you can read it at your own leisure uh, because these slides will be provided to you. But um, again, I got stuck here in Cyprus. Uh, so all of my stuff was back in, the, um, in Jordan. And so again, I had to work from online. All of my curriculum had to be, had to be online. Um, otherwise I wasn't able to send it to my families. And, um, but it was okay. We, we got through and um, we made it through and there were very little tears, but at the end of the day, uh, the kids got what they needed to learn and uh, the most vital, vital information. Um, and yeah, we made it through. So now I wanna look at these three scenarios because not only are they inspirational, but hopefully they can inspire you to think creatively. Um, and how you need to reach your students and with the level of determination that I have never seen before. Um, the first one is out of South Africa. Um, this article is about Tatanda and her team providing food and data for their students in order to keep school going. It started when they were unable to print homework because of a power outage. And so they created WhatsApp groups and they sent uh, detailed voice notes with instructions, um, and even they were going to start uh, trying to buy devices for students um, in order to reach them so that the education would not stop. Uh, the next one comes out of Northeastern Kenya. Uh, they had actually already been closed since January due to terrorist attacks. And so for many of the older students who wanted to graduate, they uh, were desperate for online education. And so a group came in and was able to provide that online education for them. Um, but even to this day, there's, the teachers have been pulled from that region. They're not going back. Um, so because of that, they're having to look at online education as the only option to reach those poor students. Uh, the last comes all the way from Chile. 
Um, this is a university student who was interviewed, and she is in her first year of medical uh, medical school, I think. And she has to climb onto her roof um, in the middle of winter because it's winter there. Um, and she has to get connected to the internet so that she can go on go on and be able to um, actually access her uh, classes. So these are just three scenarios that I found. And you can read the articles yourselves if you have time or if you would like to. Um, but in a lot of ways, this can be used to inspire us to think creatively and out of the box. Um, and hopefully put into perspective what I'm about to share with you next. Um, we are now on our third point. And how it looks in countries where internet and devices are limited to non-existent. So this is kind of going to be more along the lines of where we're all at. Well, again, we have to deal with the fact that there's uh, internet and data is expensive. Um, and sometimes you have to choose between buying food and buying data. So thinking with that in mind, um, I was inspired by some more articles because I did a lot of reading for this. Um, where they used radios to um, actually reach some students through uh, instruction. And this was done in the sub-Saharan countries. They used uh, satellite TV. Um, but what was really cool was actually this one teacher, she reached out to her village students and provided two hours of instruction three days a week. Now, she would write everything on this community chalkboard and then the students, if they weren't able to come to her teaching time, they could come later in the day and copy down on in their little notebook um, everything that she had taught. And, um, you know, it's not normal. It's untraditional. It's different. But it worked. And that's the, that's the thing. Education has to keep going. You cannot let it stop. Um, and so... I just wanted to kind of give you some ideas. There are things out there. Um, it's starting to come in now, but there are ideas, and hopefully we can inspire you to think creatively. Point number four, we're almost done. Why you need to jump on the opportunity to prepare now for remote learning. So we have already seen that COVID-19 is not the only thing that keeps students at home. But we are not out of the clear yet. So schools across most of the West, but this might also apply also uh, in Asia. I haven't quite heard yet. Um, they're still deciding. But schools are choosing to remain closed some, for some of them until a vaccine comes out. Um, and there's fear already of another wave coming. So now that we've had our eyes open to this, now that we've been exposed to this, we have a responsibility to act on it and not simply just um, sit there and hope it goes away. Um, we do have a responsibility. And so we need to make sure that our learning doesn't stop despite our circumstances. Think of us as kind of like soldiers. We're on the front lines. We need to be able to teach our students um, and we need to be able to get it to them in any way possible. And parents, you are with us as well. Um, we are there to encourage our students and we don't want them to be discouraged. Uh, we want them to stay encouraged. Um, so it's gonna take all of us to be able to keep them focused um, on the goal of getting through the school year, uh, even if it means we have to be at home. So we're on our last slide. This is what are some opportunities, what are some options and ideas you have that I have found around the world that I can share with you. Well, this is a lot and I'm gonna kind of leave it on here for a little while. I'm gonna talk through a few of them. Um, but right now, schools can start doing training. Um, this may not be applied to all schools, but for schools that have access to internet um, or teachers that have access to internet, um, 
start training yourself. Um, go online when you have some time. Um, it may only be a few minutes, but if you have a little bit of time, go ahead and start looking at, you know, what is Seesaw and what is Edmodo. Um, most of these actually have tutorials on how you can use it and you can just access them for free. You don't even have to have an account yet. So you're able to just see what it is first. Um, and then if you are really interested, you can go ahead and create accounts. And like I said, those are free for individual teachers. Um, so have at it. Um, Pre-recorded core subject lessons. If you have the ability to use a camera to record yourself as a teacher teaching your lesson, go ahead and do so. Um, it will prove powerful for the days when you are maybe really sick and you cannot, you know, go to school. It will also be really important if we are again on lockdown. Um, it provides the students with seeing their teacher's face, being able to uh, hear their voice um, and hear the lesson, um, and they can follow along with you as they watch the video. And that's going to be for people who already have access to internet. Using Zoom, great way to stay connected. Um, assign websites for extra practice. I have a list of uh, websites for you to check out if you would like to at the end of this presentation. And there's some for math, for reading, for science, um, all sorts of things for all different grade levels. And you can check those out and see what some extra stuff can be. Um, and again, accessing online libraries. Um, as individual teachers, a lot of this stuff is free. You can sign up um, and you can access it. But uh, if you want the whole school to be able to access it, you are going to have to uh, contact them and, and get a school code. Uh, for limited access to internet, sending lessons or video instructions over WhatsApp maybe once a week. That's what I did. I only did it once a week. I didn't do it every day um, because I didn't have the time. But once a week gets the instructions to them. Um, if you can, do a weekly check-in with your students. I know my students loved it. We talked nothing about academics. We just talked about what they were doing, how they were, how their day went, who they were, you know, talking to at home. That was it. And it really uplifted their spirits and changed their attitudes. Um, if you have access to a printer or are able to print, you can always create homework packets for your students. Um, if you're able to send those out beforehand, that way they can actually do the physical work. And if, if it's allowed, depending on the situation, um, they can always bring that to you and you can then give them the new week's packet. So again, this is going to look be different depending on where you're at. But these are just some ideas. Again, pre-recorded videos are a great way to go ahead and have your stuff for uh, the coming year. And create a technology plan. So for schools that are looking to upgrade and have technology. I can only recommend creating a plan so that you already have everything in place, a written down plan with teacher's input, with staff input, um, so that if the funding comes along and you're able to actually purchase those things or actually get those things, you already have a plan in place. And a lot of foundations and um, charitable uh, programs are actually going to look at that plan and say, we can, we can do this. Um, it's realistic, it meets your needs, and it's already in place and you have it. Uh, kind of just waiting for that day. Um, for those schools that don't have any access to internet at all, maybe you just have a text message and that's about it. Um, you can use radio. This was used in other countries uh, where internet is not there. So it has been tested and has been used. Um, satellite TV, even when I was in Jordan, they used satellite TV to uh, show educational programs to students. And they just ran it throughout the whole day. And depending on what grade you were in or what level you were in, you would tune in during that time period. Community chalkboards. It is old school, 
but it works. And if you are able to, writing down math problems or writing down sentences that students can check or correct is going to keep them learning despite how small it might be. Um, SMS. So sending text messages might be easier than trying to send like WhatsApp messages because of data. So if you're able to send a text message to your parents and inform them, this is what's going to be taking place this week. Um, your child needs to do this, this, and this. Then it might show that it can be cost a little less. Um, but again, it, it, it is what fits your uh, students' needs. And again, weekly homework packets. If you already have the papers, if you already have the stuff, go ahead and send it home to them. Um, if they really are struggling, if they don't know how to do something, then you can address that child one-on-one. -on -one. Otherwise, let them work. You will find that they are extremely brilliant children and can discover how they can do things on their own. And parents, it actually does bring them in a little bit more because they have to sit down and help their children. So it can be almost used as like a bonding experience, which is sometimes really good. So thank you guys for listening to me. Um, if you have any questions or you would like to contact me about online education or about remote learning, or just want to discuss like what it was like for you uh, during this time, or if you just want to chat about this, um, you are free to email me at this email address. Um, I will be doing my master's degree actually in online education um, and educational technology starting in the fall. And so this has kind of been my passion and I would love to talk to you guys more if you would, ha if you would like to. Um, here are some additional resources for you. So I have a bunch of things that you can look at at your own free time. And if, well, we're going to go to one. We're not going to go to one anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can obviously look at those things at your own leisure when you receive the PowerPoint um, in your email. So thank you again for sharing, for letting me share. Um, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sarah. Wow. That was a wealth of information. And um, I'm sure people can't wait to get their hands on your slides. I must repent. <laughs> First of all, I was so busy juggling so many things I forgot to introduce you. So, so please forgive me. <laughs> um, so I will go back and introduce Sarah, um, even though you've heard her speak and I mean, she has been such a blessing to us with the information she has shared with us. And Sarah is a seed seasoned educator who began her teaching career in the United States after her undergraduate studies. She spent two years teaching in Kentucky in order to meet the requirements to teach overseas. While still in the US, she taught in a public school, which was considered the, most, the worst school in the district. However, it gave her a greater understanding of the needs of students in high-risk areas. She has also taught multiple subjects with little to no technology or curriculum available. Um, Sarah later moved to Japan, where she taught second and third grade combined, and then to Jordan for another two years. She's now, like she told us um, just now, she's pursuing a master's degree online for curriculum instruction and educational technology. And her passion is to help teachers create goal-oriented lessons while using creativity and technology to enhance each lesson. So thank you once again, Sarah. And uh, we look forward to having you again, you know, probably, you know, on a training session this time for those who may need help with um, one, one or two of the, the platforms that you, you have mentioned. Um, I love the, the, the slide before the last where you had the breakdown for those with um, access, limited access and no access because it addresses some of the concerns that people have posted on the chat. Um, if I can just read a couple of them out. So, so someone, Steve, Stephen um, Akinyemi has said, problem of connectivity should also be addressed as a factor affecting digital technology. So Stephen, I hope Sarah's slide is exhaustive. Um, she has given many options that you can consider where, where, you know, connectivity is a problem. It is a problem in Africa and most African countries and 
and some Asian countries. And someone else also here said network also affects the effect effectiveness of our online lessons. So it is a real problem in, in certain places. And um, um, you, you, we will send those slides across. We will send this recording as well if you want to catch up on the things that Sarah has said. And all of this will be available to you. So um, I have one question. So maybe, Sarah, you can be thinking about this question. We're going to.